This is part three of our chapter five video lecture where we're going to cover one more book to tax difference that is permanent in that it's recorded on the tax return but not on the income statement. And it's favorable because it's a deduction subtracted on the tax return reducing the amount of tax liability. And that book to tax difference is for dividends and you're going to be claiming a deduction for those dividends. Remember we're a corporation and you're receiving now dividends from another corporation. The amount of this dividend received deduction depends upon how much ownership you have in the investee company. Here it says that if you own less than 20 percent of that investment company, invest, investee company, the example in our textbook is Apple, and if you buy, if you're a corporation, you buy shares of Apple, definitely you're not going to own more than 20%. But you have to report all of your income, dividend income, like we've seen in the previous um, video. But now you get to claim half of that amount of dividend as a deduction, a dividend received deduction. Now, if the investee corporation you're receiving the dividend from, you own at least 20, but less than 80%, then you get to subtract out 65% of that dividend. Or if you own 80% or more of that investee corporation, that would allow you, as we've seen um, earlier in our chapter five, it could qualify the um, parent and subsidiary to file a consolidated return. But if you're not filing, you're not electing to do that, then the dividend you receive, again, it's all taxable, but then you get to claim a deduction for the whole thing, 100% dividend received deduction. So these three percentages, you can see we're multiplying it against the dividend. But also you would take those three, here it says the dividend received deduction percentage e times dividend to get the tentative deduction. But then you also have to take that same rate and you multiply it by the taxpayer's taxable income. Here it says modified taxable income. That's defined down here. That's taxable income. Before deducting this dividend received deduction we're trying to calculate out right now. And before any NOL deduction. Remember now, you cannot carry back any NOLs. So really what this is referring to is in any NOL carry forwards, you cannot deduct to come out with this modified taxable income. Also, you cannot uh, deduct any capital loss carry backs. Although that implies you can deduct capital loss carry forwards to come out to this modified taxable income and you would take the lower of these two amounts and that's the amount that you get to deduct as a dividend received deduction. So let's take a look at a couple uh, examples. Here we have taxable income that's before the dividend received deduction but we're told there's an NOL carryover already subtracted out. So the definition of modified taxable income was that you cannot deduct the NOL. So here you can see we're backing it out. We're backing out the NOL by increasing the taxable income. In both cases the amount of dividend received is uh, 30 percent. We're assuming it qualifies for the 50 percent uh, rate. So ha uh, half of that dividend is the tentative dividend received deduction. But we also have to take 50% of the modified taxable income, which comes out to this. And of these two amounts, the lower is the 50% uh, of the dividend. Whereas here, the taxable income, 50% of that, 50%, um, is that right? three times five, three times five. Is it 14? 14. 
not 17, 14,000. Anyway, it's not 15,000, right? It's 50% of this 28,000 modified taxable income. Another thing about the um, percent limitation of the taxable income is that it doesn't apply if the dividend received deduction, the amount down here, if you subtract it out, will give you a taxable income of zero or or you go negative, NOL. That's uh, stated um, right here. If you subtract out the dividend received deduction and it creates a loss or a bigger loss, then you get to deduct all of the 50% uh, or 65% or 100% of the dividend and not limited by a percentage of the modified taxable income. Let's talk about calculating now the actual amount of tax. So things have been simplified for 2018. We just take our taxable income and we multiply that by a flat 21%. It used to be a graduated rate in past years probably going up to 35 percent maybe even a little higher than that okay but now it's just 21 percent this kind of says here in this paragraph that there's a a phase in during the year 2018 if your year ended during 2018 you have a partially 21 percent on some of your income and the graduated rates for uh, the other parts yeah, but if you're ending at the very end of 2018, then all of your calendar year taxable income tax at 21 percent. We're going to see in the next video. This video is rather short. In the next video, we're going to take a look at Form 1120. Yeah, the annual income tax return for a corporation. That includes a Schedule M1, and we'll see that in the next slide. If you're a large corporation defined as, I believe, assets more than $10 million, then you have to prepare a more detailed Schedule M1 called a Schedule M3. Really, it's just like a separate tax form. Much more detail. Okay, and in either case, M1 or M3, what you're doing is you're showing all of these book-to-tax differences we've been talking about in the past couple of slideshows. Either adding it to the um, income statement or, or subtracting it from the income statement to, uh, to get eventually to the taxable income number on the tax return. So when you file in 1120, it's going to be due by, let's say a calendar year, going to be due by April 15th of the following year. You could apply for an extension, but that doesn't extend the time to pay the tax. And as mentioned previously, if a corporation owns another corporation, or maybe a part of what they call an affiliated group, we're looking at directly or indirectly owning 80% uh, or more of the subsidiaries. And then you can file one big corporate return, combining the incomes and possibly losses. Yeah. But this is an election. But once you elect, you got to stick with it. Um, forever unless you have a good business reason to terminate uh, this corporate consolidation. Here is that Schedule M1 that's part of the Form 1120. So your starting point here in Line 1 is the net income of the companies on the company's income statement. And then the, ultimately you're coming down to this number down here which is really not quite yet taxable income. What you would have to do is subtract out the net operating losses. Again, just carry forward or carry over now. And subtracting out the dividend received deduction we just talked about to get the taxable income that shows up on the page one of the 1120. So our job here is to reconcile all the differences from your book income all the way down to the taxable income. So in the case of this uh, left-hand column, what we're doing is we're making the taxable income bigger. 
In other words, this is unfavorable differences. You're going to be adding all these numbers. On the right-hand side, what we're doing is subtracting these numbers. Favorable differences, reducing the taxable income. Going through details, here in line two is the amount of federal income tax expense reported on the um, income statement. And for tax purposes, that expense is not deducted. Already deducted to get this 4017000 So what we're doing is we're backing it out by adding that number back in. If you remember, we cannot deduct capital losses on the tax return. We can tax capital gains, but if we have extra capital losses, we got to back it out from the income statement to get to, I should say, add to back it out to get to the taxable income amount. In the case of possible uh, gains on the disposition of property, if you had accelerated depreciation on the tax return, that would be subtracted out here. But also at the same time, it's reducing the book value or the adjusted basis of the asset being sold, resulting in a bigger gain or a smaller loss. Thus, what we have to do is add in that bigger gain yeah, into the uh, Schedule M1 here. Charitable contributions, we saw there were limits, that 10% of taxable income limit. So maybe you have extra that you have to back out. Again, a deduction to back out, you're adding it in, and you carry over any excess to the next five years. In the case of entertainment, beginning here in 2018, not deductible anymore. In the case of business meals, just... Um, 50% uh, is deductible. So here's that adjustment reducing the expense. Others, you'd have to attach a schedule here, going through some detail. We talked about stock options in a previous example. Bad debt, remember we have to use the direct write-off method for tax purposes, whereas on the income statement, the financial statements, you can use the allowance method. In the case of warranties, you have to um, deduct on the tax return the actual amount paid or incurred for that year. Whereas for income statement, you can set up a reserve, an allowance for warranties at the time you sell the product or sell the service. Life insurance premiums, if the beneficiary of the life insurance policy is the corporation, then any insurance collected would be tax-free someplace probably over here. But when you make the payments like we're doing right now, those payments are, are not deducted, so we're going to back them out. So all of this has to be backed out. Again, technically what we're doing is we're adding in this 30, 374000 Then on the right-hand side column, tax exempt interest still reported as income on the income statement but now we're going to subtract it out here on the tax return depreciation especially with the bonus and the section 179 deduction that we learned um, a couple of chapters ago that accelerates the depreciation in the early years so that's our case here taking more depreciation deduction on the tax return deferred comp Generally, you would deduct that on the tax return when paid or incurred versus uh, accruing it over the tax, uh, over the employee's uh, work life um, on the income statement. So again, we come down to this figure. You would still have to subtract out the net operating loss and the dividend received deduction. That's calculated, that's reported on the page one of the 1120 to get the taxable income also on page one of the 1120. So when do you make the payments you owe to the federal government? Well, if the amount you owe is less than $500, you just pay it by the time the tax return is due. Again, that three and a half months after the year is over. But if you owe more than that, then you should be paying your taxes in, uh, in quarterly installments. It doesn't work out. It doesn't work out quite as quarters. In other words, here you, the four payments are due on the fifteenth day of the fourth month. So in the case of a calendar year cooperation, that would be April fifteenth. 
the second quarter payment is June 15. If you think about it, the end of the second quarter is June 30th, but here you're making a second quarter payment on June 15th before the quarter ends. Same thing with the third quarter, not at the end of the third quarter, but the 15th day of the third quarter or September 15th. And the last payment is not due after the year is over, but 15 or 16 days before the end of the year on December 15th. So one fourth of the tax for the year is owed on April 15th. And the second quarter, if you add that to the first, half of the tax has already been paid by June 15th, three fourths of the tax paid by September 15th, and all of the tax should be paid by December 15th. Keeping in mind, it's estimated, right? You really don't know the actual amount of the tax until the year is over and you can report all the transactions for the years correctly and to calculate the tax correctly. Again, these estimates are estimates, but if you estimate wrong, you can pay a penalty for underpayment of those estimated taxes. And the calculation of the, the penalty is a percentage based on the uh, market interest rate from the time the, the quarterly payment is supposed to be paid during these four dates up to the date you make the payment or up to the end up to the date the return has to be filed again a calendar year that would be um, April 15 after the year is over now the required payment can be determined in three different ways one way is to take a look at the total tax liability of the previous year and you take 25 percent of that previous year as a first quarter payment for this year and up to 50 percent has to be paid of the previous year tax this year by June 15 and so forth so sometimes they call this prior year tax liability a safe harbor or a safe estimate and many taxpayers both corporations and individuals would use this method because the other two methods listed here are a little bit more complicated in fact this second one here says if you know your tax liability already then go ahead and pay 25 percent of that for the first quarter and 50 percent by the second quarter the thing is you probably don't know the current liability until the year is over but here we're in the first quarter in second third and fourth quarter still the year's not over so this one if you kind of overestimate your current liability then you're probably okay and you won't be penalized this third method you gotta have a good accounting system to keep track during the year how much profit how much net income you have up to the first up to the second and so forth quarters and then you do something called annualize you may believe now you're gonna project out to the end of the year how much profit you had based upon those previous quarters then you figure out the tax based upon that total annualized income annualized profit then you take one-fourth of that tax and you pay it by the first quarter you take one half of the tax you make sure you pay all of that by the second quarter okay that's called the annualized method so of the three maybe this annualized method is the most complicated really because you have to have a good accounting system to give you those projections how much revenue and how much expenses you've earned up through the quarters it mentions down here that uh, um, large corporations defined with taxable income of a million dollars or more cannot use this safe harbor method for the um, uh, for the last three quarters you can use it only for the first three quarters okay so let's look at the uh, calculation here again this is the annualized method and there is a worksheet, uh, IRS worksheet called Form 1120. That's the tax return, but W for worksheet. 
and I have it linked in our chapter resources folder that pretty much goes through the same calculations we'll see here. So what you have to do is figure out here for the first quarter your revenue minus your deductions to get the taxable income for the first quarter. And we're going to multiply that by a factor of four to get an annualized income for the whole year. Again, we're trying to project it out based upon the past quarter. And then that annualized income we just calculated, we multiply it, um, we multiply it by 21%. Remember, that's the new flat rate. Okay, and that'll give you the tax for the whole projected year. But we're only still in the first quarter. So we take one fourth of that, and that's the amount you have to pay. Now, when you make a payment, you don't mail in a check. The government wants their money so fast, they want it deposited electronically. So I believe it's the uh, electronic uh, federal tax payment system that you have to create an account online and get a transfer from a bank into their bank account. Okay, so now going back to the previous table, you figure it out your, your income, revenue, and deductions all the way through the second, uh, well, you know what it says. You're going to just take whatever revenue and deductions you had in the first quarter, and you just double it now for the second quarter without even going through the second quarter information. And um, basically now you're just doubling up the amount. Yeah, you're doubling up the amount. You're going to have the same tax here and here, but now you have to make sure 50% of that is paid by the second quarter due date is June 15. In the case of the third quarter, here it says to take one half of the year's revenue and expense. Okay, so again from January through June, you're going to double that profit, and that's your taxable income. You multiply it by the same 21% flat rate and you have to make sure by June 15th 75% of this tax, annualized tax, has been paid. So the quarterly payments is just the difference here, yeah? the difference between these two. And then the fourth quarter you really are taking um, your June your September 30th, January to September 30th income and you annualize it. Here's the annualized figure here. Yeah, Same thing as uh, uh, dividing by 9 September. Yeah, multiplying by 12 for the months of the year. And then 21% again and then all of it has to be paid. So here's the remaining fourth quarter payment by not uh, after the year's over, but before the year's over, December 15th. Okay, let's see. Last uh, slide, or a couple last slides here. The AMT, alternate minimum tax, as it says here, is no longer in effect for 2018. But this tax, alternate minimum tax, in past years you would compare it with the um, the regular net income tax and of the two alt min tax net income tax you pay the larger and if the alt min tax was larger than the net income tax the difference would be a credit that you can apply in future years when the net income tax would be larger than the AMT but again now there's no AMT for 2018 and if a corporation has a credit being carried over to future years, here in the next slide it says that you can now still apply that credit at least 50% each year for the next three years. And anything that's unused here by 2021 can be refunded back to our corporate taxpayers. Okay, let me stop here and we'll have one more video going over the Form 1120.